Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today's show is going to be extraordinary because we are welcoming for the first time Nomi Prinz. Nomi is a former managing director of Bear Stearns and Goldman Sachs and previously an analyst at Lehman Brothers and Chase Manhattan Bank. She is a best-selling author, a financial journalist, and a global expert when it comes to money. Her spectacular career so far has included speaking engagements to central bankers, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the World Bank Annual Conference. Nomi has incredible knowledge when it comes to the history of banking, and she understands the games that Wall Street plays. This is going to be an incredible interview. Nomi, welcome to the show. How are you today? I am great, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me on. This is going to be spectacular. I'm so honored to have you here. This whole show is going to be about money, secrets, and corruption. What we love. Cool. You know, they say <laughs> the truth is more interesting than fiction. And when it comes to money and politics, this is so true. And Nomi, I want to start off with one of your books because you have a spectacular library of books. But the first one I want to start with is All the President's Bankers, the Hidden Alliances that Drive American Power, because it really lays the groundwork for the history of banking and politics, which has led to the situation that we are all in right now. The history of how and who put this into motion is fascinating. Yeah, no, and thanks for starting there, because um, aside from being involved in finance and, you know, the political implications to finance and all of that, I'm a history buff. I love history. And when I wrote All the President's Bankers, I got to travel around the country to the presidential libraries um, and dig into information that people had left dusty, um, you know, for decades um, across the country. And it was great from just seeing the country and also from just getting my hands on um, a lot of documents and conversations that otherwise weren't, weren't out there. And what I was looking for was relationships, because at the end of the day, the sort of connection that politics and finance has that presidents and major Wall Street bankers have is through the relationships that they establish, not just during a presidential term, but over decades, over generations through families. Um, And and that was really what I dug into, particularly, um, and it's interesting relative to today, the 1929 crash, um, which was one of the coolest chapters um, in that book, where I looked into six families, six major bankers who sat in a room opposite the New York Stock Exchange, literally across the street um, in New York City downtown, and tried to figure out how to save the markets from crashing in order to protect themselves. And the intrigue in the room, you, know, you can read the book, was, was, was fantastic because you had Chase chairman in there who were short their own company, but they were trying to figure out how to save it. And all these you know, sorts of uh, bells and whistles of the intrigue. Um, but those six bankers, those six banks exist today. And they were bailed out in the height of the 2008 crisis. And they remain um, you know, with these massive trading desks and subsidized by the Federal Reserve that had been created in 1913 through effectively one of those bankers, J.P. Morgan. Um, who was very responsible for not the blueprint for the Federal Reserve, but hosting the 1910 meeting at Jekyll Island, which gave birth to the origins of the Federal Reserve. And just all of these connections come to manifest today when we have, again, a Federal Reserve throughout all of these decades, um, promoting the, the practices of the major Wall Street banks and effectively subsidizing them and the markets when they make mistakes or they commit crimes. And it's really to the detriment or the lack of fairness to ordinary investors and regular people. And, you know, the fact that the relationships and associations with high political power is really what allowed this to take place. And I think that's what people miss is the very intimate connection between presidents and the people that control presidents, meaning the money. And I want you to really talk about the names because this is fascinating when we sit back and we look at history. 
Well, you know, just taking a really major arc at the history, and, and I'm going to focus on, on J.P. Morgan simply because J.P. Morgan Chase today is the largest bank in the United States, um, and it is the marriage of the Morgan Bank um, back in the day and Chase, where I worked um, over, over the decades. And one of the interesting things about J.P. Morgan was back in 1907, I'll try to make the history short, but it's so fascinating. Go for it, go panic. into it. I love this and my audience does too. There was this too. major don't panic worry. in New York City. We don't, we don't hear about it a lot because we hear about 1929 and the crash. That's more sort of you know, put in our, in our minds historically. But in 1907, there was a panic. And it's interesting today in particular uh, because copper prices today are really rising to nine-year highs. And I mentioned copper because copper was behind the panic. It was because a bunch of rigsters uh, tried to basically corner the copper market, make the price of copper go up because that was the thing of the day as well. And on the other side of that were all the big bankers, JP Morgan and all his friends who were running the major banking institutions at the time. And what they saw, once people got to know about this scam and people started selling copper against these scamsters, is all of the banks having this run of money, run of confidence. And so JP Morgan's like, look, my friends are going to get hurt at some point. So he connects to Teddy Roosevelt, who was known in history as like a, a trust buster, you know, supposedly against power. But he basically gets through to Teddy Roosevelt and he's like, look, I'm paraphrasing. I need some money to sort this out. What can you do? Treasury Department gives him $25 million, a ton of money at the time. Big bail at the time says, do, do whatever you want with it. Just, just fix this panic. So what does he do? He gives it to his friends, right? I mean, his friend bankers. And as a result, they came out fine. Some of the other banks closed. But J.P. Morgan said, you know what? I need more than this. I need to know that I can't just go to the government, but there's another power I can go to. Because frankly, I don't really trust the government's always going to have money. Um, and because he had actually bailed out the government years before that. Other story, not in that book. So he hosts at Jekyll Island this, this Federal Reserve meet. And I say host because I was at Jekyll Island. I went, I went through the documents. I, I went through the ledgers. He wasn't at the meeting, but he was a member of the Jekyll Island Club, which was the club of all the major moguls at the time. And so the, the Robert Barron families um, at the time of, of the early 1900s. And so he was able to kind of host others who came. The Senate Banking Committee had a couple of major bankers. And they all kind of sat there over this Thanksgiving period in, um, you know, off the coast of Georgia and created the blueprint for the Fed because they wanted a backup. They wanted to know that if things got really bad, there would be some institution that would be there to bail them out. And that is, that's the history. You fast forward through more than 100 years and we had the financial crisis and then we had President Obama come in and then we had the Fed basically support the financial institutions, including J.P. Morgan Chase, the biggest bank in the country. And who does Obama bank with? Where are his assets? J.P. Morgan Chase. And who's the most powerful banker? Jamie Dimon, who runs J.P. Morgan Chase. So even though he wasn't even a Morgan, he, he basically carried that legacy forward. And there are so many other connections along the way. I'm just giving you the bookends. But all of them created a situation where the Fed supports the bankers, the presidents support the bankers, the bankers connect to the president. And depending on the decade and what else was going on in the economy, it just manifested with different details. It's just, it's a mirror of what happened with Obama. The first thing he did was go in and bail out the banks that supposedly, you know, know me, when we give our money, the bottom line, we give our money to the banks. The banks are supposed to keep it safe for a fee. That's the way this is supposed to work. They're not supposed to take all of our money and invest it in risks that they think they're going to make millions and billions and pocket it and then put our money back at night. But if they lose it, oh, oops. So if they win, they make millions and billions and buy their yachts and their estates and the world and banks and media companies and whatever. It's such a scam. And it's so fascinating to go to know that it goes way, way back in time. And it's just repeating itself. And I think that if people realize this, they'd take a stand, but it's, it's almost a secret, you know, it's coming out, but it's a secret. 
Well, it, it's very, because it's historical, because it's complex, because um, Wall Street, and I, I worked on Wall Street for years, is very good at sort of coding what it does in, in things like, yeah, but we're helping, we're lending to the community, small businesses, depositors, et cetera, um, that they're able to kind of put forward this, this space and, and shake off these crises that they get help for um, and, and sort of come out ahead. And that's why, for example, even in this pandemic period, um, we had Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan Chase, two banks, again, I worked with, um, come out and, and, and post record trading profits. That means that their recuperation out of the, the sort of closed economy pandemic environment where, where people died and, and, and people lost businesses and people lost jobs and we're still behind on regaining those jobs and the economy is reopening but slowly they were making record trading profits not higher than last year record and and that's because they relied on a lot of the federal reserve um, subsidies and also these connections with not just the highest levels of government but, but multiple levels um in, in the government, you know, through the Senate and House and, and in both parties. You know, this is not a partisan thing. This is like sort of power to power. Right. Right. And people have to realize that this is not Republicans or Democrats. This is power. This is great. This is power. This is That's power. exactly right. Wow. This is so interesting. I want to touch real briefly on the Federal Reserve. Of course, you know, G. Edward Griffin has written... Um, I've had him on like four times. He's written that spectacular book um, um, all about the creation of the Federal Reserve. It's real interesting that it was created on Jekyll Island because it sounds evil. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because the resort now, it's an hour resort. Um, they're actually giving away, or they have all these like deals now because of COVID, um, post-COVID to get people to come back there. It's actually a beautiful resort. I mean, they picked this this nice place, but it was clandestine at the time. Now there's a bridge to it. You can drive to it. But at the time it was disconnected from, from um, you know, sort of the coast. And so you could only get there um, by boat. So that it was kind of, it was more secretive just physically as well. Right. It's like its own little castle that, you know, the moat is around it. Um, turning to the central banks of the world, um, your latest book, which again, you have epic titles, is called Collusion, <laughs> How Central Bankers Rigged the World. And I really want to explore the role of the central bankers and how they've sort of played in the world up until now. Talk about who they are what they do, and what are some of the specific scenarios where they've pulled the strings? We hear a lot about central banks. We hear a lot about the Federal Reserve printing money, but there's no one that really goes into what the central banks are. They are private, right? Central banks are, are private. In the United States, the Federal Reserve is supposed to be independent from the government. This idea of calling it Federal Reserve was, was kind of to sell it at the time in 1913 to the public um, by Woodrow Wilson in a way that made them feel sort of comfortable that the government was overseeing what they thought was a Wall Street crutch, which it is. Um, and that was kind of where the name comes from, but actually it, it operates independently. That said, the, the appointment to the Board of Governors of the Fed and the chair of that Board of Governors of the Fed, who's currently um, Chairman Jerome Powell, is suggested by the president and confirmed by the Senate. And so technically, there's a very strong connection, but officially, they're independent. So that, that's, that's one thing to know. In different countries, it, it, there's a different relationship. For example, in China, the People's Bank of China, which is the central bank of China, um, is, is very much an arm of the Chinese government. Um, they, they, they work in tandem. And different countries, again, have different relationships. The three main central banks in the world, the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, the ECB, um, and the Bank of Japan, um, operate pretty much um, in the past to balance what the level of interest rates were, the cost of money. That's basically what an interest rate is. It tells you how much banks have to pay in order to receive money that they need that they put into the system. So if it's zero, which it is right now, 0%, it means they effectively don't really have to pay for the use of that money, right? And so when the Federal Reserve or any central bank puts rates low, what they're trying to do, what they say they are doing 
is helping Main Street, is helping the mainstream economy. Their, their idea, the narrative, is that if banks have more money more easily, they're going to lend it to real people. It's going to go to the Main Street economy. The Main Street economy is going to grow and everybody's going to be happy. The reality, um, and, and the European Central Bank, the same, Bank of Japan, the same. Bank of Japan has been doing this for almost 30 years. Uh, the Federal Reserve has now been doing this for um, about 11 or going on 12 now. So it, it's not like this is necessarily connected to the real economy, but that's what they say. And that's what they say their mandates are. This dual mandate, helpful employment be achieved, which means help the real economy of more people working, which means there will be more people producing and all of that um, and keep inflation low, keep, keep prices low. Um, and so there's, they're always sort of balancing. Um, and you hear this talk about balancing their dual mandate of full employment and low inflation, um, meaning that prices don't rise by more than the economy grows or that people for based on the jobs they have can, can afford. In practice, what has happened since the financial crisis of 2008 in the United States, for instance, is on average economic growth as measured by GDP has been 2% a year. Some years lower, some years a bit higher. On average, it's been about 2% a year since 2008. The stock market has basically increased by 370%. The total size of the economy has grown by 12% since 2008. 12%, 370%. <laughs> so, so whatever the central bank says, um, you kind of look at the numbers, the, the, the increase is greater um, in, in markets than it is in economies. The global GDP has increased by about 20%. And the total global market cap, if you kind of look at the major markets and the sort of developing markets kind of connected, um, has grown by two and a half times globally. So 20%, 250%. So, so this is where the money's going, but central banks are meant to just be tweaking the cost of money so that there's full employment and low inflation or, or steady rise in the economy. The disparity, the, you know, the out of balance is just extraordinary. And um, that leads me to where are we now? Um, what do you foresee as a result of all of us, you know, the pandemic, the printing, um, the situation that we're in right now? Do you see a deflationary period, an inflationary period? Do you see a crash? What, what do you project, Nomi? So keeping in mind that the, the real economy and the markets are, are kind of two different things, um, as, as, as we were just talking about, um, I don't see a crash in the near future. I mean, I see a lot of volatility. There is a lot of revolving between, you know, we hear the reflation trade, the recovery trade, growth, value, all, all, all those sorts of different um, areas where money is flowing into the stock market. And why is it flowing into the stock market? Because it's abundant, because it's coming from central banks. The Fed has grown its balance sheet from $3.7 trillion in, in the middle of 2019 to $7.5 trillion, almost double. Now, part of it, they say, has been to help with uh, the, the stimulus package, the CARES package last year. But, but, but the reality is, if it's just to help, it can be deployed. It's not being deployed. It's just kind of sitting there because the bonds, the treasuries that the Fed bought from the banks and the mortgage bonds they bought from the banks in return for part of that $7.5 trillion dollars, um, still lie on their books. The money's out with the banks. Then it goes into the market because that's the fastest place money itself can grow. Why? Because it can grow by just being there. If a lot of money, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, if you think of the, you know, a, a barrier between money and return um, and it goes away because there's so much money flooding across the barrier, it, it, it creates its own momentum. And that's one of the reasons why the stock market um, has, in both these post-crisis periods, gone up by so much more than the real economy and so much more quickly. As a result, when we think of crashes, either because of something external happening, like, like the pandemic or, or a new wave happening or, um, or, or some exogenous variable we don't know about happening, you know, a meteor hitting some part of the world or whatever it might be, whatever it might be, right? There, there can be a crash, um, for that reason, there should be a crash by sheer virtue of the fact that a lot of that money has been manufactured and then sort of grown itself. 
Um, but because it's still abundant and it's still continuing and central bank policy is still what it is, um, there is still um, a supply of money that will go into the stock market for now. Um, there's concern about inflation. I think that in terms of real economic inflation, it's, it's still subdued um, in terms of overall economic growth. We do see certain prices going up, but I think there's going to be, um, you know, a lot of uh, areas where they're up, like in real estate, like in suburban real estate versus like urban flight real estate and so forth. There are going to be areas where prices rise, but then there's going, to be, there's going to be areas like commercial real estate, like all those businesses that close that can't afford to find a place to reopen again, or those employees who don't have uh, the jobs that they once had, that's going to keep prices on the other side subdued. So I don't look at inflation as, as sort of one number. I look at it as, as how are more people in the real economy impacted versus certain asset classes impacted. There will be asset class inflation. Real estate prices in those suburban and residential areas will continue to go up for the foreseeable future. Although I think that is also a bubble in the making um, discussion for another time, but, but not, in, not in the next year or so. Um, and, and I think as long as central banks continue to commit to no cost money, which is what they're doing up until like 2023, um, there's always going to be that push pull, which is ultimately going to keep the markets um, to, to an extent lifted. So, so what does that mean for the real person, the real investor, uh, the retail investor? It means picking the areas um, where they, they can participate in that upside um, in a way that they're also protected on the downside. So for example, not borrowing money in order to go into the stock market, um, not investing more than they can afford to lose. Looking at some of the um, hard assets that will be protected in an inflationary period and also can be used for growth um, as things are moving um, in, in a more recovery manner. For example, um, you know, silver, copper, you know, minerals that can be used for, for uh, you know, th those, those wirings in those new residential homes, for uh, the electric vehicle cars that will ultimately um, be more abundant, not just in the United States, but throughout the world um, and, and so forth. You know, looking at things that have value and have use value, but also um, will increase in value as inflation starts to creep in. This is a very positive outlook that you have. I'm not usually positive. <laughs> I'm not. And, 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 and this, is, this, is, this is actually an irony because I, I, I oftentimes am, am, am precisely not positive. Um, and, and I'm tempered positive in that I think, um, no, that's not the right word. I, I, um, I think there are areas that will improve and I think there are areas that will, will fall behind. So I'm, I'm selectively positive, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, and that's because I think ultimately – there, there is a sort of recovery that can happen if vaccines go through, if people get back out, if they are able to, to borrow and to, to potentially find, um, you know, new ventures or, or come up with, you know, better innovations for the companies that have survived. I also do think, though, that this, this distortion between the stock markets in general, the, the larger companies, how, how banks are basically involved in, in more speculation, in more leverage, in, in helping hedge funds leverage more in order to sort of get more of the really frothy upside is, is going to have a moment where it, it, it will, um, you know, will come back down on, on the markets and, and on them. But again, they have that external help. So I, I think the real economy is going to be stuck in between. It's going to lag. Um, the markets, it always does. And I think it will lag them forever. Um, but, but the volatility in the markets can also present um, those opportunities for investing smartly um, in, in, in things that will hold value and that are usable. Right. You know, I just had uh, David Hunter on. He is a um, contrarian uh, financial expert. And he said, a lot of what you're saying. There's a lot of doom and gloom right now because we all know that the, the dollar and every fiat currency has been printed in a massive way. We all mm -hmm. know there's corruption in precious metals and you know all kinds of things. However, if you use it right and you know what you're doing and you realize what's going on in the background, you realize, number one, this is not going to last forever. There is going to come a point 
where the price will need to be paid. But as long as you're cognizant of this, what I'm hearing you say is use this situation to your advantage. Mainstream media, of course, you know, they, they don't tell people anything like this, like, you know, ride the wave, use this to your advantage and know a crash is coming because you're going to have to pay the price. But it's really interesting perspective. It's very positive, actually. You can sort of use oh. what they're doing to your own advantage. <laughs> that, 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 that's exactly right. And, and, and the, the major difference um, is that because they do it with other people's money um, and, and, and we do it with our own money, is that, you know, we just have to be that much more cautious um, and, 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 and take little bits if we have investments off the table along the way. And, and again, find those use values and, and they're personal. I mean, they're, they're, they're sectoral as well, but they're also personal um, that work for you over the long term. And, and that actually keeps people less emotional um, as investors because you're not, you're not always out on a line. Um, by going with, okay, this is what's happening now. I'm going to, you know, everybody's going to pack into this stock or everybody's going to pack into, you know, this crypto or whatever it might be. You're, you're, you're looking, you're, you're trying to stay stable. You know, it's like if you were on a boat and, and the boat's rocky or, or even if it's going smooth and you know, you're going to hit some waves because you always do. Um, you know, generally, if you stay in the middle of the boat, even when those waves happen, you, you, you're going to at least be, best protected. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of how I think, I, I think people should look at investing and, and using this period to, to, to be educated and, and educate themselves and not necessarily be impatient. Um, because you do see a lot of headlines, you know, this, this, you know, sort of retail person made like $30 million last night. And, and that's fine. And, and that, that, that's great um, for that person. And um, generally, incrementally increasing is, is a way of staying in the middle of that boat so that when it, when it does rock from side to side, you're like, okay, but I, I, I'm, I'm okay. I'm solid here. I'm not going to freak out. Yes, exactly. Your own and I'm going to get to where I need to go eventually. Mm -hmm. Right. You've got your own path. Right. You know, it's such a, <laughs> it's such a huge point right now. Naomi, every time you wake up, you hear Elon Musk made, you know, $50 million overnight, just like you just said, you know, and Bitcoin's, you know, taken off and it's too late now. And, you know, dog coin and dodge coin or whatever, you know, Elon's calling this today, you know, and the uh, precious metals, it's silver, it's, it's way up. Oh, no, it's way down. Oh, no. You know, and it's so it can be so um, encompassing. It takes your mind. Number one, fear of missing out. You think that, you know, it's all over. Everybody else got on the boat and you didn't. There's a lot of sales pitch is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of hype. And so that's something you need to really be cautious of right now. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and, and that's not the hype. The hype's not going, not going away. Um, people make money out of hype. Uh, companies make money out of hype. And um, it, it's, 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 it's trying to dial down that hype, the noise of that hype for, for you, you know, individually and as an individual investor um, and, and sort of look at the long-term and what's right in front of you kind of at this, like when you're driving, like, you know, at the same time, I mean, if you're, if you're looking down at your lap and you're on a highway, that's, that's not good. Um, you know, normally you're, you're looking somewhere over, you know, your dashboard so you can kind of see what's coming ahead and, and where you're going. And, and I think, um, you know, that's just, uh, you know, that, that, that's, it doesn't mean you don't see the pretty tree and, you know, you don't see, you know, the lovely you know, bird that just flew on the side of your car, whatever. Like it, you, you can see stuff, you can notice right. stuff, you can choose things to notice. Mm -hmm. um, but, but you keep, again, it's, it's, it's just maintaining that composure for your, you know, in, internally. I want to touch on uh, precious metals, and then I want to go into the possibility of a cashless society, because those are two questions I really mm -hmm. want to get your thoughts on. First of all, Silver, um, what's going on? Are we really in a short squeeze? And how much manipulation could be cured by this, if at all? Well, the, the thing with Silver is there, there, there are some major ETFs, exchange-traded funds, that um, trade on the basis of 
as if they had silver, but they don't really have silver um, for delivery. And, and as a result, they, they have the ability to sort of squeeze prices or, or lift prices depending on um, you know, where they're at in that cycle or that day or that moment um, and, and how investors come in or out. It's a little bit different with real silver um, because it's, it's, again, it's physical. It's, this goes back to, and it's a preference, you know, phys- physical uses of silver um, exist. And so therefore mining of silver actually exists. Um, and just in terms of, you know, actual supply and demand in an economy thing, you know, th- that, that match will be made. Now the investing in, in silver um, is, is a little bit different again, because of some of these paper traded or more paper traded exchanges. Um, and I think that in general for investing in silver, it's best to find um, real silver. Um, and, and again, even, even if that's like, a little bit, or or to find there are there are funds that actually uh, specifically have real silver backing them, um, and and they're not generally the largest silver exchange traded funds. They're 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 generally smaller funds, but they commit to to having um, silver physically in their possession, um, so that the, the the prices match the actual value of of, of that asset. Um, and so in terms of the manipulation, um, yes, there is. But in terms of considering manipulation to also be noise in a way, um, it's best to look at um, investing from the standpoint of, of, of physical, um, either funds that have it or, you know, buy some coins, you know, buy, buy something you can afford. I personally, um, and I, I, I've said this for years, I, I, I tend to buy coins as birthday presents um, from my niece and nephews because they're, they think it's cool. Um, it's kind of a way for them to have a little sort of investment set of coins on their own. Um, and it's a way to sort of keep connected to, I, I do it in silver, not gold, because it's affordable. Um, <laughs> and, and it's just Oops, a way I to- I lost that gold piece, Aunt Naomi. <laughs> yeah. Like, How oh, can you never get me gold? <laughs> no, but it's, it, it's, it's a way to just, um, it, it, it's like what my grandmother used to do with, with, with us when she bought us savings bonds which now are, have no value because of the whole printing thing and, 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 and you know, the lack of interest on them. But, but back in the day, they did. Um, now that value, that appreciation, that sort of wealth storage for the future is, I think, in that precious metal sector. That's really interesting. That's a great perspective for your kids, you know, and, you know, just to, to save and, and to turn them into little pirates, get them, you know, used to having. <laughs> well, they, they find places to hide. You know, they, yeah, it is. Yeah, right. So, um. Let's touch on this cashless society notion. This really scares me. Um, I know other places in the world have gone to it with the um, getting out of cryptos so much into the digital uh, dollars, um, especially places in Asia. What are your thoughts about the United States? Are we looking at a cashless society on the way? Um, I, I actually do think that is that is where we're going. Like if, if by cashless we're talking about using our iPhones or our smartphones to transact and, and touch things. Um, in, under, in other countries, um, for example, the UK, well, I mean, throughout Asia, throughout Europe, um, that has been happening for, for years. You know, you, you, now you don't because of COVID, but in general, if you go into sort of, you know, a bus or something, you just sort of put your phone down and, and, and there's all these sort of cashless uh, connections that, that basically come out of what, what is ultimately your bank account. Um, and, and I think that in, in a way, the United States has actually lagged that uh, conversion, um, but only, but, 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 I, but I, I, see it, I see it coming and I see it for two reasons. One is because of the convenience of the same reason we have all these apps on our phones. You know, there, there is this general notion that if we don't have to carry stuff and if everything can be in one place and that place happens to be our phone, which happens to be electronic, which happens to not hold cash, um, that's easy. And um, the more that people do that, the more it's easier to transact in that manner. Um, the issue, the problem with, with, with the cashless um, stuff is that, you know, there can be breaches, there can be data breaches. Um, obviously, there, there can be security breaches. Um, there can be all sorts of things that can go negative and all of a sudden you don't have physical cash and your app's not working or your cash isn't there or someone else hacked it or, or whatever. Your bank account's and, gone. <laughs> That's what yeah, scares it's, me. It's, 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 well, it's or your there. internet's down. I mean, and, and, and your cellular's down. Or whatever, whatever the case is. I mean, look at the power outages in, in Houston. I imagine not a lot of 
uh, well, Texas, not a lot of people were able to conduct you know, cashless transactions when a lot of the power wasn't available, you know, I, I imagine. And so, you know, th there are there are those concerns, but but I do think on balance, we're, we, we are creeping towards that. It's just that movement out of the, the physicality. I like cash. I like to be able to say, okay, I have a nice little, you know, $500 here or whatever, just that I know and, and maybe it's just my own personal paranoia, but I really feel like when you have numbers on a screen, whether the electricity goes out or we get hit by an asteroid or whatever, we've got nothing. So I like the, the idea of the precious metals, but they are an investment and they are heavy. You know, you can't carry yeah. them with, there is no ease to that right. as, as liquid as they may be. So, um, kind of timeline are you looking at because i really think that's where we're headed to i really think it's being pumped in nancy pelosi had you know the digital dollar in one of the um incentive programs back in the summer it was taken out but they were actually very close to initiating a digital wallet for everyone to get paid their you know their six hundred dollars <laughs> mm -hmm, uh -huh. It was supposed to last you for six months. Okay, here yeah, you go. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Right. And that everybody invested in the stock market, but they actually used to pay rent. <laughs> and, and who pays rent for $600 for six Right. I yeah, mean, exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. These people are in la-la land. I mean, exactly. they, they are so delusional. They're paid by our tax dollars. They still get paid. They're yep. $100,000 or 130 thousand dollar salary while they debate from our tax money while they right. debate giving us back our tax money in the form of six hundred dollars for six months that's right i'm <laughs> that, that's that's right <laughs> what are we what are we doing here right. but anyway what's your timeline for the cashless society what, what do you think you know five years ten years are we way out are we close I, I think there will always be some cash around the on the side and i i would Wait, i would think that um it's not a bad idea to, to, to have some as part of your savings. I mean, right, the, the idea of you know, putting money under the mattress came because at the time um, people couldn't get their money out of the bank. So, so now you're looking at a, a potentially similar situation where you may not be able to get your money out of some electronic medium, right? I mean, it's, it's the same idea. And that's where cash under the mattress came from because you could see it and it, it, was, it was there. And, and I think in general, uh, whatever the timeline is and wherever we go, I, I think that's something people should look at. And I also think that in some of the developing uh, countries around the world, having, you know, not, not everybody has a smartphone, not everybody has a bank account. And so for that reason, there's always going to be an element, um, you know, it could be for 10 or 20 years where some people are going to have to transact and, 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 and will be transacting um, in cash in the United States and with respect to, you know, members outside of the world of people who travel in and out of here and so forth. I think, I think on average, um, I, I don't know what the actual date is, but, but I would think that within a five year period, uh, there's going to be a lot more people who don't touch cash at all um, than there is today. And I, and I think that's ultimately the measure is, is you know, do we go in and, and touch a phone to a thing? Um, I was out um, in LA and noticed that some of the, the bars were reopening, you know, in, in outside seating and stuff recently. Um, and I was out with my dog, so I couldn't, I didn't take any money with me, but I happened to have had my iPhone because we take our iPhone with us. And, you know, one of the older ones at a store, I'm like, hey, you know, I'd love to come in and, and, and have a drink, help you guys out. You know, do you take, you know, Apple Pay? And they're like, no, we take money. And I was like, okay, well, I'll come back. And yeah, so there's, there's always going to be that. <laughs> I think you're never going to 100% go to cashless um, good. in that respect. Good, good, good. I'm, I'm all for a combination of both. Yeah. You know, Jim Rogers told me uh, about two months ago that we were absolutely going to complete cashless. So I was like, ah. No, so um, I do think you, you you have to be right because there are people that they don't have bank accounts. There are many people in in the not just in the world but in the United States yeah. that they don't have identification. They don't right. have the way we live in society and what we assume everybody has is erroneous. Um, and, and also, not to cut, but but also again, like those those instances where there is no electricity or cellular connection or, or some emergency, um, everybody should have 
forever some cash, you know, reserved in order to, to be able to, to deal with that. Um, because even if you have a physical credit card, which is kind of somewhere in between, um, you know, th their system might not be able to take it because the internet's down or, or whatever it might be. So, I mean, I think having cash and anyone who's been in any kind of emergency situation, power outage, fire, fire flood, whatever, um, should know that they should have some money on this, like physical money on the side, no matter where we go. That's a great point. I think, honestly, you hit it. You hit it on the head. I think the people that are all for, you know, cashless society, we don't need cash. My brother have never been in the situation that, <laughs> where right. their phone doesn't work right. <laughs> or what, or they lost their phone or just, you know, like I said, we get hit by an asteroid. Yeah. I keep saying that because I read that within the next 10 years, we might be. So we're getting ready for we that. We don't know. Who knows? <laughs> We've got the asteroid. We've got the belts coming through. Um, you know what? The last thing I want to ask you, what's your best advice to people? Uh, people in the markets or out of the markets, how, how should they prepare for what uh, is coming as far as our economy goes? Um, well, I think, again, staying, staying balanced in the middle. So having the flexibility um, or the cash aside or the liquidity aside, however that looks, um, to be able to, to take opportunities when they come. I think from an investment or sort of wealth growth perspective, it's to kind of you know, keep an idea of what your time frame is versus what the market might be doing at any given moment, because it may crash in a couple of years and it may go up and some sectors will do better than others and some names will go away and some will rise. I mean, that, that's just the nature, um, especially now with more and more participants um, computerized and real. Um, and so the idea is, I think, to pick things um, from an investment standpoint that, that are diversified. I mean, it sounds very sort of old school, but, you know, that you do have something in, 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 in precious metals that you don't have to touch, that you have... Um, they're also involved in companies um, and technologies that are that are moving forward, um, because I think that's really exciting. And, and I think that, you know, whether whether it's in 5G, whether it's an in infrastructure, which hopefully someday we'll get ourselves together as a country from a private and public perspective to like actually build stuff again, um, you know, that, that, that we're involved in some of those companies or, or we create our own, um, you know, initiatives. And, and I think that having that diversification and also keeping calm therefore um, because you're balanced when things are a little bit crazy um, is ultimately good mentally and emotionally and also um, financially. Um, I think that the smaller cap part of the market um, generally tends to reemerge after a crisis relative to the larger caps where, you know, sort of pools of money go and then they go out and then they go in and then they go out and you get all that sort of volatility, which we're now starting to see in those um, because they're, they're more homegrown. Um, and generally um, if they are, producing things and making money. Um, I don't really generally recommend in companies that don't make money. And, and there are a lot, you know, it's just, this is not, <laughs> it seems obvious, but you know, th th there are a lot um, or that don't have very, very solid growth plans that I get and I, I, I can sort of get on board with. So it's really ultimately doing some homework, spending a little time. Um, and, and that will really pay off in the end if things go badly um, or if things you know, sort of bump up and down. Um, and, and I think that keeps people sort of more protected. So that education, that time, that patience, that selectivity, um, I think is all very important. And it's just such great advice to not chase the hype. I'm, I'm so glad you touched on that because it's such a huge thing that's happening right now. It's so easy to get like, I've missed out. I've got to get in. I've got to, I've got to do it quick. Your advice is slow down, know what yeah. you're doing. Don't chase the hype. You know what? This has been an amazing interview. I'd like you to touch on your books for everyone. I think you have seven books. Am I right? Seven mm -hmm. books. And they're all just, like I say, epic titles. And also tell everyone how to follow your work, not just titles. I mean, these books are full, you guys. You know, if you like corruption, power, and money, <laughs> which I'm, I'm all about it. <laughs> you got to check our stuff out. Go ahead and, and let them know what all you have. Um, thank, th thanks, Michelle, for that. That's <laughs> very kind um, <laughs> um, ness of use. Um, so I, 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 my first book was Other People's Money. I actually wrote it just out of when I quit Wall Street, quit Goldman Sachs. I'm not going to go through all my books, but I, I only mentioned that in particular because it really looked into energy and communications and power and what was ultimately going to be the housing, subprime, banking instigated crash. Um, and it kind of laid that all out. So it was my first book and it's still available through Amazon and my website. Um, 
And I, it just, um, my, my researcher just mentioned it to me because he's like, I was reading your conclusions and like, they all made sense and they all like came about. Like, how did you know that? And this was like many years ago. I'm like, I don't know. It's, I just, that's what I wrote. Um, and I have a bunch of, I have a book called It Takes a Pillage, which came out after the uh, financial crisis, like right then, like early 2009. So it was like a crazy writing experience, like right as it's happening. Um, All the President's Bankers, you mentioned, that's um, one of my favorite books because I got a chance to really dig into the history of, of this country and the relationships between presidents and bankers and the Fed and money. Um, and Collusion, my last book, which was um, also just about globally how the central banks actually rig uh, the markets, how they interact and what that means for the real economy. I have a novel in there, Black Tuesday, if people want to have a sort of easier read um, on the 1929 crash. Um, and I'm working on another book right now um, for that will be out uh, early next year. So stay tuned. And my website's on www.nomiprins.com. And my uh, Twitter handle is at nomiprins. Now, um, your updates on your work, I know you update people upon, you know, your financial projections and what they see. Are, is that all covered at your website? A lot of it, because if I, if it's either going to be pieces that I'm writing as things are happening and they'll be covered or, or you know, I'll tweet like other people will tweet. Um, and that gets captured, you know, as it sort of comes out. So, so as, as I have thoughts or pieces, um, you know, in between books, uh, they'll, they'll be captured there. This is really great because your books sort of like, they lay out what you're learning. You know what I mean? I noticed this, you know, you you're like, I've, I've learned all this. I'm writing a book. I've learned all that. I've written, I'm writing a book. You know what I mean? I, I know right. this is what's happening. And it's these, these are just, they're like thrillers, but they're real. And that's why I started off saying, you know, um, the truth, they say the truth is more interesting than fiction. And boy, it really is. And now that all of this is coming out, because we didn't know any of this, we, you know, our parents and grandparents didn't know any of this. Otherwise, we wouldn't be where we are right now. That's right. <laughs> so what's going on behind the scenes is incredible. We will have you back soon. You'll become one of our regular guests, please. Excellent. Thank you. Well, beautiful. Naomi, this has been just so amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you so much, Michelle. Take care. Ah, yes. Nomi Prince, best-selling author, investigative journalist, and financial expert for the Industry Experts Panel. I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. 